Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, my name is, or good afternoon, and I do understand that it is morning for some of you, but where I am, it is afternoon. So good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Mealy. I'm the Senior Director for Diversity and Inclusion at the American Political Science Association. And I'm so excited to be able to welcome you all to this uh, APSA Professional Development Roundtable. And it's co-sponsored between the American Political Science Association and the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Um, today, we are joined by the following panelists. Dr. Ray Block of Penn State University. Dr. Block is a committee member on the APSA Committee on the Status of Blacks in the Profession. And also Dr. Jamila Mishner. Dr. Mishner is on faculty at Cornell University and she is the chair of the APSA Committee on the Status of Blacks in the Profession. And Dr. Tiffany willoughby Harrard. Dr. willoughby Harrard is from UC Davis and is the president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. And then finally, Dr. Stephen Rathgeb Smith. Dr. Smith is the APSA Executive Director. Welcome to all. And uh, before we start, I would just like to also acknowledge the wonderful history that um, we are able to stand on the shoulders of. So in terms of the APSA, we are very blessed to be able to have a diversity fellowship program as well as the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute. And these are our flagship programs that help us to advance recruitment and retention and advancement of historically underrepresented individuals within the profession. I would like to note and, and also just to issue a word of, of, of honor and acknowledgement for Dr. Jewel Prestige, who was instrumental in founding not only the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, but also founding and, and creating the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute back in the early to mid eighties um, from Southern University. And the Institute was first held on the campus of Southern University through a partnership with Louisiana State University. And also these two institutions partnered and collaborated with the American Political Science Association and with INCOPES to make sure that these programs were available for young students. And then secondly, the diversity fellowship program, which many of you may know as the minority fellowship program, started out as the Black Graduate Student Fellowship, which was also another program that Dr. Prestige and her colleagues founded in order to increase recruitment for students from um, African-American communities in order to attend uh, political science graduate school. So we do honor those legacies and we're very happy to be able to say that these programs are thriving and that we do have a, a number of individuals that we interact with on a regular basis who are alumni of these programs and who are teaching in colleges and universities, HBCUs, MSIs around the country. And if they're not on faculty or if they're not in academia, they are thriving in other aspects of the professional world. So in the legal world, in, in private and in public and governmental sectors as well. So thank you so much um, for that opportunity. So what we will do today is speak about professional development and the importance of professional development, but we also want it to be able to tie professional development to the conference theme of black futures at the crossroads. So um, I have a series of questions that I will pose to the panelists. And then also, we would like to leave some time at the end for individuals uh, in the audience to ask their questions. So if you do believe that you have a question um, for any of the panelists, please make sure that you add that to the chat so that we can make sure to ask those questions um, when the time is right. So I thought what we would do is to start out with a question about um, how one can make sure that their advocacy work, their policy work, or their high impact work shows up um, in their research agenda and in the questions that they ask. We do know that, especially in the INCOPES family, there is a wonderful tr tradition of scholar activism, of public engagement. Um, and so for so many scholars, it might be difficult to merge the two worlds of your 
public engagement work, with your research work, with your teaching, with your service on campus. How do you do that? How do you find the time to do that? Because not many um, faculty departments kind of highlight that or show you or train you um, in the ways of doing that effectively so that it services your teaching and your research as well as the public work that you do. So to start that question off, I'd like to go to Professor Mishner. Yeah, thanks for the question, Kim. I think it's a really great one. And thanks to everyone who's here. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are. It's, just, it's, a, it's sort of afternoon for me. Um, uh, so anyway, the question is a wonderful one and it's one that I appreciate particularly because I've grappled with it. I think from the very beginning, um, many of us, I think, imagine ourselves in this work, not just so we can get lines on the CV and not just so we can get tenure, but because we have people, we have communities, we have a uh, purpose that we're connected to, that we're motivated by, uh, that we're committed to. And so even as we try to navigate uh, uh, and travail academia and sort of jump every you know, hurdle and, um, and hoop that we have to jump in order to be successful in academia, we still have those commitments. And um, it's not easy. And I don't even think always or usually advisable to say, I'm just gonna hold off on anything else that I'm committed to on a moral, ethical, political level until after I get tenure and then I'll do that, right? For, and I, I don't think we can always or should always do that in part because it's really hard to spend five, 10 plus years between graduate school and, um, and the tenure track putting off what you really care about, what you're really committed to, and then thinking that you're magically gonna turn back to it once you have tenure. Um, and so many of us want to and should stay committed to those things, even as we're making our way through graduate school and we're making our way through the tenure track. Um, I was lucky enough to have, I think, one of the best possible examples of how to balance scholarship and activism and engagement. Um, because Kathy Cohen was the chair of my dissertation committee and is just somebody who was doing it. And so the first thing I would say is find a model um, and a mentor, someone who's doing this and also managing success in the discipline, who you can watch, you can learn from, and when necessary, who you can get help from. You know, Kathy was never like, yeah, go out there and do activism all day, every day, right? She was very much like, make sure you check off the boxes that they want you to check off or else you'll be gone, right? And I appreciated that balanced advice and feedback. You know, once I got to Cornell and I started a tenure track position, a couple of things. One is know your department and your context. So I figured out there are some forms of public engagement that my colleagues really, really do appreciate and I will get credit for and I will be acknowledged for. And that gave me a sense of like what kinds of things I could kind of um, invest more in with a little, with a bit less risk. And there were other things that I still decided I wanted to invest time in, even if it wasn't highly valued by my department. Cornell has a big prison education program and I spent a lot of time teaching in prison, working with the prison education program. And, you know, I guess that's that's somewhere on my CV, but nobody for the most part cares or notices, but it was deeply important to me. Um, and there were still opportunities at times I used to leverage Cornell's resources to allow me to do that. So for example, I would apply for um, course releases and I would teach in prison during the semester I got a release from teaching on campus. And um, that might, not have been what they envisioned I would be doing with that additional time. And I also had to make sure that I was trying to publish and do other things so that I wouldn't end up shooting myself in the foot. Um, but what I would say is survey your institution, know the institution and figure out how you can use the institution's resources um, to advance both what they want to see you doing and what you understand your purpose to, to be. Um, the other thing I would say is don't try to reinvent wheels. There are a lot of people out there doing work in community, uh, doing political work and uh, figure out who you can work with so that you're not doing everything from scratch and combining these things. Who can you work with while also leveraging some of these very privileged and wealthy institutions, their resources. So Cornell, they love like engaged teaching. And so I identified some partners, some organizations in my community that I really admired their work. So for example, I work a lot with an organization that does um, 
quote unquote reentry, working with folks who have gotten out of prison and our local jail and are trying to reintegrate back into our community. And I decided to teach a big course on campus called Prisons Politics Policy. My department loved that I taught that course because it drew a big enrollment and that gets more resources to the department. They were super thrilled about it. And so I was able to get an engaged teaching grant and that was money that I could use to work with my community partner to figure out, okay, I got 150 kids in this class. How can we use some of the, the energy and the know-how and the knowledge that they have, um, recognizing the limits of that to work with you in a way that's gonna help your ends, right? So leveraging and combining the resources of the institution to work with people and community so that you're doing multiple things at the same time, you're moving forward on the fronts you need to move forward on as an academic, but still remaining committed to the, the, the things that you, that you care about as a human being in the world who wants to do more than publish papers. So I'll stop there because I could go on forever. This is my topic, y'all. Well, excellent. We, we love your enthusiasm and I'm, I'm sure we'll circle back to some of the great points that you highlighted in your response. Next, we'll go to Dr. Willoughby Harard. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I greet you from UC Irvine, which is the historic land of the Tongva and Ahachaman people. And I think probably my most consistent um, type of advocacy work has to do with taking students to conferences. Um, the higher education system, like every other institution, has a hidden curriculum. You cannot be thrown into it as a fully formed uh, pre-tenure track, you know, PhD, you know, lecturer, adjunct, and supposed to know how to navigate the space. It does not make sense. Um, you have to build a pathway from as young as possible to people understanding that intellectual life is part of their life. It's part of how we make meaning in society. It's not antithetical to the other parts of our creative lives and our cultural work in the world. It's just part of being a person, right? Uh, writing papers, reading books, you know, writing poems, dancing, those are part of just being a person. And so if we don't take particularly um, undergraduate students and high school students to spaces like this early in their lives, they don't get a sense of their futurity in these spaces. So that's one of the things that I do. I think I follow the Du Bois principle. You know, W.E.B. Du Bois published in newspapers, in academic journals, in, uh, you know, fiction and short stories. And even there's research as a book published about musical uh, work that he did. I mean, so much, it was every kind of genre. He practiced and flexed his writerly voice muscles in every genre, in every, every, every genre. Um, and it's important that we do that today. I'm representing Black Girls Brilliance, which is helmed by uh, Natalia Molabazzi and uh, uh, Latanya Williams. And it's a t-shirt. This is part of that genre work I'm talking about. This is an organization that does transnational Black feminism work with Black girls. You can be representing and engaging people and asking questions with something as a mundane you know, as a as a T-shirt, um, Dr. Melina Abdullah right now is on the radio, living from our NCOPES Facebook page with Dr. Shayla Nunnally, one of our past NCOPES presidents, and they're uh, using the radio platform to talk about the lives of Black people and how we actually extend extend our vision, extend our lives, and not think that because we're at a crossroads, we have no range or opportunity. Um, publishing textbooks, you know, um, the things that we do in kind of, I guess I really like um, the word mundane or the word everyday or the, the word quotidian, because I do not take those practices, um, you know, for, for accident. So let me be more precise. So I have been an activist on a number of issues for a very, very long time. Um, 
You know, I worked and marched with young people in 2006 in San Diego um, with one of the largest youth uh, walkouts when um, a Senate bill was proposed that was really going to racialize and criminalize their existence here in the country. And thankfully, people like Tony Afinia at Providence College had been working on Black and Brown political interests and doing research on that and working on Afro-Latino communities in the Northeast for a very long time. And so we had a conversation at ANCOPES about that. And he said, next year, let's do a series of panels. And we went to every single political science conference with that same set of panels working on these issues around immigration rights. I had really difficult conversations with folks like Robert C. Smith and James Taylor, and really we tussled through these. One of the most important articles that I've ever written came out of that activism, those conference presentations, and that work that those uh, scholars did with me to really press me to be in a really grounded historical conversation about how Blackness, how race, and how immigration articulate with each other in a kind of long historical fashion. In the same way, um, I was given the opportunity by Black Lives Matter Los Angeles to travel around to all over the country and all over Orange County where I live, which is also the home of the John Birch Society and also the home of the most multicultural Patriot Party <laughs> activist in probably in North America. Like we have truly the rainbow coalition of uh, the right wing that will get down in the street with you and beat you down for wanting to vote. And because of that BLM Los Angeles leadership and inviting me in, I was able to work with a number of my graduate students after I had done a year of presenting, presenting, presenting to write a piece on the life of Corinne Gaines and um, you know, be able to document something about the Second Amendment and everything that she stood for and the, you know, the really tragic way that she lost her life. And the last example I'll share um, has to do with a paper that has never been published, but that I presented at an ENCOPES conference in San Diego. So I teach at UC Irvine, which is known as the house that Afro-pessimism built. My two senior colleagues, Dr. Frank Wilderson, who is well known around the world, and uh, Dr. Jared Sexton, have been the architects of in a whole new branch of Black thought. I've never thought of Black thought as integrationist versus nationalist. It is more rhizomatic. It is more full of branches. That's how we end up with the Du Bois that's you know, writing as a Victorian in 1899 and as a Black Marxist historiographer, you know, by 1950. So um, it is rhizomatic, it is roots, there's crossover in Black thought. There's a major tension between Afro-pessimism and the Black radical tradition, right? So the stuff that my senior colleagues write about and the stuff that my advisor, Cedric Robinson, has written about have sat in tension of necessity, a generative, a powerful intellectual uh, tension. And people typically associate Robinson's work with freedom dreams, you know, that Robin Kelly has talked about. They typically associate Robinson's work with rebellion and resistance, and they often critique it for not being able to sit enough in the tragedy and the suffering and the violence of anti-Blackness. Well, I was wrestling with that, wrestling with that. And I went into his tiny little book, Black Movements in America, published first by Rutledge in 1996. And he has like seven pages where, this is Robinson now, where he lists off the names in the same way that we do in uh, Movement for Black Lives activism. You know, when we say, say her name and we call people's names, it's just a litany of names of Black everyday people who protested because they were trying to ride the trolley, who protested because they were trying to keep a business open, who protested because they were trying to integrate a school in the 20s and 30s, um, and who then were subject to lynching or murder or rape. And he does that. It's this litany right at the heart of the work. 
And that enabled me to, to sit with Robinson's work at a conference presentation and talk about mourning in the Black radical tradition as also being a part of what we do. And so I think the simplest answer for me to this question is um, thinking less about binaries in our politics and more about overlap. Yeah. And that's how my advocacy shows up in my research. Thank you very much, Dr. Willoughby Harrard. That was very informative and uplifting. Um, and I, I jotted down the term rhizomatic. So I will keep that in mind. Thank you so much for that. Next, we'll turn to Dr. Smith to hear his thoughts. Hi, thanks, Kim. And um, I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased to um, be able to co-sponsor this important professional development panel with, with NCOPES. Um, so so I, I have some remarks I, I, that I'm gonna talk about in terms of um, APSA's role in fostering public engagement. But I think in response to Kim's question, I'll talk a little bit about my own experience in issues around public engagement. Um, uh, I, um, I got my PhD at MIT. Um, I, I entered, it's hard to believe I entered MIT about 40 years ago. Um, and um, I was in my first year at MIT and there was an internship that, opportunity that came up with one of the state uh, agencies. And, and so I, it seemed like an intriguing op opportunity. It focused on social services and issues around uh, the delivery of social services and issues around equity and uh, in the way it was being delivered in Massachusetts. And, and uh, I, so I took the internship and it connected me with um, uh, a, a number of amazing nonprofit organizations around the state. Uh, in fact, when Jamila was talking about her connections to the local community organizations in Ithaca, it reminded me of how beneficial the internship proved to me in terms of connecting the kind of research topics that I was interested in, in terms of the kind of relationship between government and nonprofit organizations and, and the real world of policy and practice. And so the, the, this internship then uh, led, created a lot of great connections for me, um, which then ultimately led me to do my dissertation on this topic. Um, and I kind of broadened it out and, um, and it eventually got, did my dissertation on it. And indeed, eventually after that, got, it, got a publication, you know, numerous publications out of it. Um, and it's influenced my, my career ever since. And I, I think I've also, um, uh, I, I was fortunate to be able to work in policy oriented schools, which also have a kind of orientation um, that fosters public engagement. They love public engagement. Um, they, they encourage public engagement. Um, again, there's still, there's still, of course, issues around what counts for promotion in, in, in policy schools. So I don't want to minimize that, but policy schools tend to be um, to, to push, your, push their faculty to um, uh, be more engaged um, in, the, in the public sphere broadly defined. I think the the other the other thing that I um, uh, would would urge people to think about is that you know to take advantage of opportunities like writing op-ed pieces and um, uh, you know talking with journalists. Um, I uh, I think it, it it can initially sound a little intimidating, but um, to and but I think I found it to be quite helpful and. Um, and in kind of raising one's public profile over time, and it can lead to more public engagement work, and that can then help you with your research and your teaching. And so, so I would, I certainly would encourage people to think about opportunities to, to put yourself out there in the public sphere. Um, um, and then I, I think the other other thing I would mention is that um, I, I was also fortunate to be an editor for many years of a journal. And, and one of the things that I always thought about was, well, what's the, what's the, what's the impact of this research? And I think we are in the, in the discipline, well, not just in political science, but in social sciences, we, 
when we sometimes think about that question, well, we think about, well, what's the impact on our, uh, on the, the, the generation of knowledge and, you know, we'll disseminate our, our results widely and our colleagues will read our work. Um, but I think that, that um, it's also, I think, important to think about, well, how is my work gonna influence policy and practice? And, and, you know, I, I, I'm based in, I'm actually from in Portland, Oregon at the moment, but um, at the Western Political Science Association, which coincides with the NCOPE speeding, but, um, but I'm based in DC. And, and if you talk to people at NSF these days or other federal agencies, they're always, they're, they wanna know what's the impact of your work. Um, and, and so I, I think as you think about your own research, I think that it's important to be thinking about, well, what is the impact of, of my research on policy and practice? How is this going to foster greater equity, social justice? Um, and, I, and how does thinking about those questions influence the way you, you conduct your research? Um, and I, again, I think increasingly both um, public funders like NSF, but also certainly private foundations are, are very interested in the applied uh, implications of the research that you do. And so I think that thinking about how your research is gonna influence policy and practice, I think can also be very important. And again, increasingly important question for um, both public and private funders. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Kim. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, and we'll, for this question, we'll now turn to Dr. Block to have his response. Thank you. Before I even get started, thank you, everyone on this panel, because I'm learning a lot about y'all that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm also realizing that this is a simultaneously straightforward but really hard question. The good news is I think about it all the time. So I'm basing this on something that's happening right now. We're doing our annual evals. And you know how this stuff works. You normally get to put in some stuff in your narrative about what you're doing and your tendencies and all of that stuff. And a lot of places are really going in on these diversity statements. You know, we're training our students to do them. People on the market are producing them. And for me, it's basically a service statement because pretty much everything I do is grounded by these principles, this idea that representation matters, that organizing matters, and that community is really, really important. And so I thought about this, like the question is, how do you pull it off? You know what I mean? How do you make these things work successfully for you? I'll be honest with you, I can't not do it. I actually tried to not be that kind of scholar. I tried to be the silo person, the person that put his, his nose down and kind of operates under what I'm going to call the mainstream rules of how you're going to be successful. And I suffered for it. I don't talk about it a whole lot, but I had to move to another university because it didn't work out. In the university that I was at, it was precisely because I had sort of lost track of my community. I had forgotten what I knew in the sense that I'd forgotten how important representation is and how important organizing is. And so I have to do this stuff. It's not really a choice because I'm not the same scholar if I don't do it, right? But insofar as this is something that's kind of who I am, I will say over trial and error, I figured out some things that work for me. And I'll start with that community stuff. And so because applied work, if you want to use that word, it's kind of looks sideways at most political science departments. You kind of have to justify why you do it. I chose deliberately to be affiliated with FM studies. And so like whenever I got a choice, I would literally set myself up to where if I could do it 50-50, I would be 50-50 in both units. Whatever institutional arrangements allow me to do that, I just do them. Because when I'm amongst my folks at AFM studies, no one's talking to me about how applied work is less than, you know, they're actually applauding me for doing it. I have colleagues who are doing it too. And if it's institutionally arranged, then it's part of my file. And it's a way for me to justify that I'm doing this not only because it's important for one unit, but it's also important for who I am in terms of what my scholarly identity is, you know. So I'll say that, right? I could talk about a lot of stuff. I am a community engaged pollster for the African-American Research Collaborative and do a whole bunch of work where we use that service work to sort of like help out with national conversations about race and politics, you know? So I guess that's a strategic use of the blurred line between research and service, you know? But I wanna talk about something that a lot of people don't know much about me for, and that's my faculty development 
And so if I start back with the story I told you about how things didn't work in my first job, I actually went through the NCFDD and was one of the people that participated in Kiri Ann Rockamore's National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. And I'm just living life. I'm trying to make sure I don't make the same mistakes two times, right? But I love the program. I love the boot camp, and it meant something to me to be part of that community, right? And so in that community, I'm pretty sure that if I didn't do the NCFDD, I probably would have still got tenure at my second place. I'm not saying that, right? But I wouldn't have felt good about it the way that I felt good about it having gone to the NCFDD because it gave me an opportunity to prioritize stuff. And to be very strategic about what it means to navigate the disciplines that I was in. And that was invaluable to me. It was so invaluable that I ended up coaching for the NCFDD for like seven years after serving on the other side of things as a participant because it mattered so much to me, right? And I would say that the idea of, I guess, merging different lines of what our jobs are to teaching the research and the service, I love helping out faculty colleagues. I do. It's one of those things that I tend to excel in in terms of being encouraging and supportive. And I really do think it's important because if my community isn't there, I got to go out and get it. And this is how I go out and get my community. You know what I mean? Like they might not be on my campus, but they're in this network that I'm in where all of these people are genuinely concerned about making the discipline just a little bit better than it was before. And truthfully, if we're successful, some of us are going to go into admin, some of us are going to advance, and we're going to be in positions to make decisions at some point. And that means that if people have a sensitivity to diversity and equity and inclusion, and they're in a position to make some decisions about it, who knows, maybe those decisions will reflect that heightened sensitivity when it comes to the stuff. And this goes back to the whole representation thing that I'm talking about. One of the things that I'm most proud of right now is that I'm no longer working for the NCFDD. But when I came to Penn State, I came charged it in and um, they don't even have what I'm going to call an institutional arrangement with the center. And so I was complaining about it, like, oh, y'all need to be set up with the center. Y'all need to be set up with the center. And as much trash as I talked, I ended up giving myself a job. And my job currently is we have a homegrown version of the faculty success program that's working uniquely within the Penn State system. And our priority right now is mid-career faculty members, basically people like us, folks who are, for lack of a better term, in positions where their options and opportunities are rhizomatic, right? Like you could do a hundred things in your path to coming up to your you know, point as a full professor. And because the strategies are so many, the outcomes almost seem overdetermined a lot of people and we're trying to help people along the way so they can figure out what path they want to take and really stick to that path and do it efficiently as they navigate that step between being an associate tenure professor and being a full professor which is a period of time that makes up some of the most productive years of a faculty's career and they do most of the stuff during that time and they also have elder care and child care things to manage and they're also working on what their identity is going to be at that point because most of the time for most people pre-tenure your whole goal is to get tenure you know and so like you don't get a chance to think really hard about who you are and what it is you want to do in some cases until you get tenure and then you figure out these things and so I don't even know if this is making a whole lot of sense but the thing that I wanted to make sure that I talked about here is that I can't not do this stuff. I got to. You know, it's one of those things where I actually suffer intellectually and personally if I don't. The other thing is, is that when I'm being strategic about it, all of my service priorities are the things that I care about. One of the things I really care about is faculty development. I can show leadership in that way. And I need this stuff because I want more faculty that look like us to advance. They can do whatever they want to do, but I just want them to advance because I think that this one gets better as these things move forward. And I believe also very firmly that all of this stuff is rooted in those three guiding principles I told you about earlier. Representation matters, organizing is really important, and having a community is really, really important. I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Block. And uh, before I move on to the next, question I just wanted to share with the panelists that we we did get a nice um, positive response from 
Dr. Jessica Stewart, who says this is so helpful and empowering. Sincerely, thank you for this. Thank you for the transparency. So I just want to echo her feedback in the chat. So the second question I would like to pose, uh, and I'll also at this point remind everyone that's in the, uh, in the audience, if you do have a question, please make sure you drop your question in the chat or, or raise hand, and then we will get to you at the end of the panelist question period. So this is a related question, but it's focused more so on providing advice and mentoring to students to undergraduate students and to graduate students who may be thinking about how they can juggle their studies and also wanting to be involved in the community. So what is your advice to scholars and students in particular who wish to apply or translate their studies into an applied setting to help their community? Um, specifically, what types of organizations on campus or projects can they get involved in? Do you know of any specific internships? Uh, how do you advise your students when they ask questions about getting involved and also keeping that balance between successful academic studies and being engaged in their community? So I will come back to Dr. Mishner for this one. Sure, uh, this is great. And I, I second the, um just the excitement about an appreciation for the transparency and just for folks sharing their experiences. And it's really um, cool to listen to everyone and learn about everyone um, who I'm sharing this panel with. So, you know, interestingly, recently, just a few months ago, I took on a new role as uh, Associate Dean for Public Engagement at Cornell's Public School of Public Policy. So um, it's really cool because Part of the reason why I took the role is because I wanted to work on these exact questions, right? And I wanted to uh, think about how to like create infrastructure and use the resources at a place like Cornell to provide opportunities and support for faculty and students who want to engage beyond just like traditional academic forms. So. I think um, you know we've talked about some of the different elements of this uh, for faculty and I think for students, whether graduate students or undergraduate, it's kind of different depending on what level, but there are similar kinds of challenges. So the first thing that I always tell students, and I think this is especially true for students of color um, who much like faculty of color, black faculty in particular and black students in particular, um, understand themselves to be beholden to, have a responsibility to and accountable to communities. And so they can't just show up and like get their A's and do their own thing and be completely in their own minds and their own worlds um, in the same way. It's sort of uh, you know similar to what Dr. Block said, which I agree, which is like, I literally can't do this any other way. <laughs> like I will be worse at, my job at the things that folks want me to do um, if I'm not also able to pursue um, commitments that reflect my understanding of my purpose. And I think students feel that really strongly as well. And of course they're pressured into like focusing on grades and doing well, and they have to worry about getting jobs and all of those things are important. And so then they try to layer on the other stuff on top and often overestimate how much is possible um, and end up really truly burning themselves out. And so um, the first thing I guess I would say to students is like, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself because it's hard to be able to give and pour into and share your knowledge and your strengths with your community and with um, anyone if you're frazzled and like burned out and not healthy. And I just feel like I see this um, culture of like overwork and overcommitment, particularly among students of color. And I know where it's coming from. It's coming from that place of feeling a sense of responsibility to community, uh, but it's manifesting as overwork and it, it, it's a, it takes a toll. And it also sets a precedent. Like you don't wanna start overworking when you're 18 and do it until <laughs> you're 50, because then suddenly it's like, Folks are getting sick and dying early. And just so thinking about pacing yourself, right? You don't have to do it all now. Um, but at the same time, recognizing that you do want to do 
uh, a, a lot now and you have the energy and you have the ability. And so I think that's great. I, I would say like, you know, one thing that helps is prioritizing. What do you get excited about? What are the causes um, or the issues that you stay up thinking about or wake up early thinking about? And if you identify those things that you get most excited about, it gives you something to focus on. Of course, similarly, like I said before, figure out what your university's resources are. So Cornell has this whole big focus on engagement for undergraduates and public service and undergraduates can get grants. You can get an unpaid internship at a community organization that can't afford to pay you and then have your, your university pay you if they can't, right? Because they have the resources. So why not take their resources and then go invest your time and energy in an organization doing important work in communities that maybe doesn't have the same resources. So I'm not telling you to work for free because many of us, I know I couldn't, I didn't have that luxury when I was in college, but to figure out when you, where and how you can get resources from the places that they do exist to support the work um, that you want to do, right? And um, that's important to you. The other thing is, again, um, thinking about how you can figure out who's doing the work and work together in productive ways with them. You don't want to show up in community and be like, I'm here to solve all your problems because <laughs> there's already people in those places doing the work. And often coming from these educational institutions, I, I, I'm always checking myself on, you know, I don't want to have this elitist attitude that I have all the knowledge and I have all the, all, all the things to offer and I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna help people, right? Instead, it's like, how are we gonna to work together so that I'm able to share and also learn? I'm, I'm able to, um, to support work that's already ongoing in community. So part of what I always tell my students is slow down and look around, figure out where the good work is happening and think about how you can be supportive of that good work. You don't wanna be extractive of it, you don't want to distract from it. Like, hey, I'm here, give me something to do, right? Because I want it, I want an internship, I want it, it's all about me, right? You don't want to center yourself in that work either, which is a mistake I sometimes see students make. Instead, you want to figure out what do I have to give? What both like in terms of my talents, um, but then also in terms of my time and energy that's going to be healthy for me and sustainable. Um, one of the, the biggest mistakes I see students make and I make myself, if I'm being honest, is over committing because I'm excited and like, yeah, I wanna do it all, I wanna do it all. And then I'm working with the community organization and they're relying on me to show up in a certain way. And I'm not able to show up because I committed to more than I could actually do. And, and then now I'm dropping the ball on a front that I really um, don't want to. So just really stepping back and thinking, where's good work being done? How can I support it? What's realistic for me? How can I leverage resources that are already existing and work with people who are already doing good work and pace yourself. You have your whole life. You can have a small experience now and you're learning and you're building as you go and you'll be able to do more and more. I can't tell you how many quote unquote small things I did that led to the next opportunity, to the next, to the next, to the next. And then it's like, you know, it's, it's what, what Ray said, what Dr. Block said, like, you know, you can choose now of the, the, the different ways that you want to, to move in your space and in your institutions and in the communities that you're connected to. Um, and so build, don't feel like you have to do it all now, but what you do do, do it in a way that's reflective of your values, your priorities, and your recognition that you're a whole entire person who needs to be healthy and have proper boundaries. Dr. Mishner, thank you so much for that wonderful advice. And before we move to the next uh, panelist to hear their response, we do have a follow-up question for you, Dr. Mishner, that's in the chat. Um, Allison Rowland says, thank you so much for the to the panelists. It is incredible to hear the ways you've used institutional resources to make impact. For Dr. Mishner, could you speak more on the back end of teaching system-impacted people uh, the UC campuses have underground scholars, but it's hard to make momentum because I'm assuming um, because of lack of funding here. Yeah, I, that's this is a great question. I'll give you a quick example here because so sometimes funding is really important, but I've also found that there are other resources that you can find on a campus that can be valuable. So, for example, Stu undergraduate students are 
I mean, I don't think of my students in an instrumental way, like their resources, right? But they have something that they can give. So often they have time on their hands, they have energy, they have motivation, and they want to do this work. So one of the things I did years ago, um, that it, I'll, I'll give the example that's from this re-entry organization that I work with um, in, in, in my local area. And I, they have a data development committee. So a handful of people who help them make sense of like data about different institutions in the county, the local jail, what have you, and try to use information like that to develop their advocacy strategy and so on and so forth. And I had been working with them just as an individual, right? And they said, we would really, we don't know what people who are re-entering Tompkins County where Ithaca is are going through. Like, we don't know, and like, we're over here trying to advocate for them. And we have some of these folks that we're working directly with, but we don't know on a whole, as a whole, like, we don't have like enough, deep enough knowledge about this to really be able to craft um, the kinds of policy proposals and try to advance the kinds of policies that are going to help folks. It'd be great if we could like talk to a bunch of people in our community who are returning from or have been to, that just takes it takes a, a, a level of uh, effort that they, and, and people power that they didn't have access to. And so I was teaching a course at the time, prisons politics policy, and I told students, I'm gonna have an engagement project. We're gonna work with this community organization. If you're interested, you can apply. And instead of taking your final exam, you can all semester long participate in this engagement pro project. I had a group of amazing, like about 15 students who agreed they went through intensive, I trained them, we did all this stuff. And then they did in-depth interviews with people in the community who had experience with the criminal legal system and were trying to reintegrate back into the, the community. They did about uh, 60 of these interviews, which is a small county, so it's a lot. Um, and, and then the next semester we had a team continue and many of the students from the previous semester, even though they weren't taking the class anymore, still wanted to continue. So I got them set up with independent study credit so that they could still do this. Um, and we ended up transcribing those interviews, writing up a report. The students presented some of the key findings to our county legislature, and they were able to get the legislature to appropriate funds. When we, one of the things we figured out was the biggest problem that people re-entering had was housing, finding housing. They were so heavily discriminated against by housing providers. And so our county government invested in um, uh, a house, uh, something called Sunflower Houses, which is a housing complex, a really one of the nicest ones in our community, specifically for people with criminal backgrounds, so that they have an option, some place to live that's not substandard and that's affordable, and that offers all kinds of services that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Direct line between my students in class and a, something being different in people's lives in our community. Now it took like three and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> lots of different groups of students, a lot of time and energy on my part and the students part, but not a ton of money, right? Um, we had like some university, like small, tiny little grants here and there to pay for things like transcription or what have you, but it didn't take a lot of money. The students using their time and energy was the main resource. So just thinking about given the resources you do have, what can you do, right? Um, and that's different for everyone's context, but I think if we know our communities well enough and we're looking for the opportunities we can find them. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishner. Uh, Dr. Smith, do you have advice that you typically give to your students about how to be engaged on campus or in, in their community? Well, I'll, I'll make a, a few brief comments. I thought Jamila did a, a fabulous job in describing uh, um, what what she would recommend, and I, I it's hard to hard to improve on what Jamila's advice was. So um, so I would just add a few other things. Um, I think um, to be careful if you, you know in terms of your community engagement, um, uh, it is uh, there are many exciting opportunities out there that may look really attractive for you to be engaged and to make a potential difference. But it, it's also true that many organizations have issues around capacity and, um, and, and being able to really fully take advantage of um, volunteer volunteers or interns in, in the, or students. So I think it's to be, be careful about what kinds of 
opportunities that you select because you you want to you want to experience where you can have an impact and and it really also depends upon the readiness of the organization to work with you and to support you. Um, you know, when I talk to uh, people who work in community organizations, they often say that, you know, having an intern often means more work, right? You know, ideally an intern, really you want to invest in the intern and you want to have the capacity to support the intern. So if you are, as a student, are thinking about uh, in getting engaged in a community organization, be careful and make sure that you, you uh, firmly believe that the, the organization has the capacity to support you and have it be a meaningful experience. Um, I also think that um, uh, taking advantage of collective opportunities that may be on campus or maybe in the community are also important. So that, um, uh, Jamila described her office that she now directs. You know, many universities have those kinds of offices, and and they they support a wide variety of campus-based activities that connect people with the with the community. And so, if you don't feel like you have the time to get directly involved in a uh, in a local organization, you can also get involved in in some community-wide activities that also can collectively have an impact in your local community or or regionally. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Dr. Block, how do you advise your students that have these kinds of questions and or interests? So I think small stuff. And so part of it is that I haven't had many graduate students at this point, but also because if I'm counting undergraduate students too, like every year, it's only about a handful of people that I interact with that are kind of moving in this direction. And so what I do is I call them odd jobs. And so rather than a semester long thing where you get class, class credit for, I'll ask a student or a couple of students whether or not they wanna jump in on something that I'm doing. Cause I'm always doing something and I'll pay them. You know what I mean? Like I usually ask from the community partners that I'm working with to give me a little something that I can use to help out with a student, you know? And these things are, they're, they're temporary in the sense that if we're doing some community engaged polling, I need some data work done. If we're preparing things to communicate with community partners with document creation might be one of those things. And they'll do it if they like it, they might come back later and try some more of these things, you know? And so like, it's not necessarily as, I guess, programmatic as some of the things that Dr. Missioner and Dr. Smith are discussing. But it's my way of getting people an opportunity. And so like normally that just means that I'll just put resources in front of people when I have them. And I'll invite people in. The people that return end up doing longer term work with me. The ones that don't still get a really beneficial thing out of it too. And sometimes if I can't compensate them with money, I'll figure out a way to make class credit work for them too. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Block. Uh, and Dr. Wilby Harard, if you're available, um, how do you advise your students when they have interests um, in assisting the community? Um, so I have one really great story about this. Um, there's a student called Cheryl Flores, um, who through the good graces of um, our co-program chair, Davin Phoenix, was able to attend the Michigan program. You know, Michigan has this wonderful program they run every year for undergraduate students to come and present their research. And so Cheryl always wanted to do stuff on literary journalism, had come to university um, because we had this Lit J program, not realizing that we had no contacts with any black print media. And that was the kind of work that she wanted to do. But luckily we're close to Los Angeles and there's nothing but opportunities. So, you know, historic places like the LA Sentinel and also the LA Weekly, there's just a number of different kinds of places. And so um, Cheryl and I in office hours did some cold calling, you know, and found a placement for her at a weekly black newspaper and created something for her like that. I mean, the, the large uh, redistricting project grant that uh, Dr. Franklin and Dr. Block um, have helmed for the last number of years has been another one of those places where, um, in addition to teaching people this vital research skill, they've made their research 
for democracy, right? Let's be very clear what the stakes of their research is. They have made that available to students all over the country, to professors all over the country. Um, I mean, you'll have to say how many campuses it is, but students at my campus were able to participate in that program. And I'm, I'm really grateful to say, um, you know, Katie Porter, our representative, um, there was an attempt at redistricting us. So I live in campus housing. It's highly subsidized. I basically live in Newport Beach and my housing is about 70% low mark, below market rate because the University of California owns it. Right, which is it makes it possible for me and my family to live on campus and be able to afford um, on the salaries housing in California. And our campus community nurtured and supported Katie Porter and the redistricting process attempted to make it so that our representative um, would not be able to represent us. Um, they tried to redistrict us away from the person that represented our interests. So um, I shared those two stories because sometimes there's not a program in place and you have to just kind of rough and ready build it. And then other times, like I think a number of people have said, don't recreate the wheel. Um, you know, say yes when somebody sends a CFP, you know, say, you know, even if you don't have capacity to do it, you know, say, say, say a yes, even if you can't be the one to walk it through, see if you can hand it off to somebody else that you trust, um, you know, or to students that you trust that can move forward with it. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Willoughby Herard. I just want to thank all the panelists for you know, the very thoughtful responses. I heard a lot about um, making sure that you you verify the programs that you're getting involved in, um, that and look for programs that might have a connection to the campus or to the university. You look for university resources that might be able to pay you, even if that local organization cannot. Um, there are a number of externship programs and internship programs that you can also uh, locate funding through. Uh, and I'm, I also would like to acknowledge and, and, and honor the work that all of you spoke about in terms of if there aren't opportunities available, oftentimes faculty members will take the time to create them. And that's a lot of work. And I just want to say thank you for that work. It's work that often goes unnoticed, unpaid. It's hard to um, list it on your CV uh, because it might fall outside of all the other buckets that you are asked to do in terms of service. But when, when Dr. Willoughby Harrard said that she and her colleague sat down in their office and started making cold calls, that's a lot of time and effort that they took to do that. And so that's wonderful work. And I just wanna thank you all, all for doing that. Um, we do have an interesting question that I want to make sure that we get to. This will be kind of a rapid response from the panelists just to kind of save time. But Asha Jones says, thank you so much for all of your insight thus far. I'm in the first year of my PhD program, and this is extremely helpful in demystifying the road ahead. One question for you all, what's the, what is the something you've learned along your journey? that you would want your first year self to know? And I know that a few of the panelists have already responded to Asha, but if you do have um, a, a one or two sentence response, what is something that you wish that you knew in your first year of grad school that you now know? Uh, let's start with Dr. Mishner. I think she already responded. What was your response? I did respond and, and I talked about how community is really, really important and keeps you grounded, but. I would add one thing, one additional thing different than that, which I guess is like, be yourself. <laughs> Don't try to like rearrange yourself to fit what you think the academic mold is. You know, you have to adapt and learn some, but like be yourself because you will regret trying to contort yourself into someone else, but you won't regret being yourself. And of course, growing, but remaining true to who you are. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Block. Sorry, I'm just going to repeat what I said earlier. Merit, I don't, I, the, more, the older I get, the less I believe in it. You know what I mean? I'm just going to be honest with you. I've seen too many great people fall and too many not great people succeed, right? 
So this is actually getting back to what Dr. Missioner said, be you. And that means also figuring out what you want out of your scholarly career, which is a lot of thinking at this point, I know, right? But it's a lot easier to operate from your definition of what successful is than to take someone else's on because that's a sliding scale. And at some point you'll realize that like on the receiving end of whatever that sliding scale was. And so I'll just say that again and stop there. Thank you, Dr. Block. Dr. Smith? I'll make two points. One is I think, um, uh, apropos Jamila's comments, I think that I would make sure that you think about who your community is. Um, you know, when I think back to when I was uh, in the early years of my PhD program, um, there was a tight knit group of us who, who uh, socialized together. We took some of the same courses together. We've ended up being lifelong friends um, and we're still friends 40 years later. Um, I think those, that kind of community, creating a community for yourself, I think can be invaluable um, in terms of helping you through the, the, the actual graduate program and then also helping you through as you navigate the, an academic career. Um, and then second, uh, you know, be open to um, uh, new opportunities that you may not have thought about. Um, you know, I, uh, I needed some money when I was a graduate student, so I took a TA ship at Harvard, and that led to all kinds of new opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and again, I'm, I, again, I've been very fortunate over the years, and so I, I don't necessarily think, but I, I do think that the point that taking advantage of opportunities that, that may lead you in new directions, I think is something that I, I also would encourage you to think about. So. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Dr. Willoughby Harrard. Um, I am the prototypical person who did uh, what uh, um, was said about trying to change myself. Um, I went from uh, Cornell as an undergrad and had done three majors and then went to UCSB and completely lost my voice. And it took me all the way until my um, field work year in South Africa to regain my voice. I spent most of my first couple years of graduate school pretending like I knew what was going on and nodding my head and not asking questions um, that I needed to ask and suffering stuff that I didn't need to suffer. Um, like I applied for the undergraduate mentoring program at the end of my first you know, um, summer because I was like, maybe they can help me. And they were like, you're already a PhD student. You can't be in that mentoring program. So. Um, as hard as it may be for you to ask for help, um, ask for help, ask for help. The help is there, the help is there um, with whatever it is. And if people don't receive you, ask somebody else because somebody has the answer to your question. Do not be by yourself trying to figure it out. It's too big a thing we're doing here. Ask for help, ask for help, ask for help, ask for help. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Willoughby Harrard. And, you know, it brings to mind how important meetings and conferences like INCOPES are for asking for help and for finding mentors, um, for finding transparency, for people that will really just tell you point blank, this is what I experienced. Um, here's how you can avoid this, or here are some of the skills that you need to, to gain in order to make sure that you're ready to be prepared for the next step. So thank you so much for that. And I, I think that last comment leads us into the next question quite nicely, which is how can associations and organizations like INCOPES and like APSA support or better support scholars who wish to pursue engaged research? So I will first go to Dr. Smith on this one. Um, thanks. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, uh, you know, I'm uh, Kim, and I often talk about how um, uh, you know APSA has a lot of potential tools at its disposal to encourage public engaged work. But we are also not we're not an accrediting body. We're not we don't control departments. Um, we don't control their promotion and tenure standards. Um, and so, so I, I so with that caveat in mind, I think. The way we have thought about it is we have we can confer legitimacy 
and encouragement on publicly engaged scholarship. We can provide financial support to publicly engaged scholarship, and we can provide training and professional development, and then also working through other organizations. So in terms of you know, legitimacy and credibility to public engaged scholarship. I mean, you know, we have a whole array of tools at our disposal, webinars, you know, participation in the annual meeting, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, various kinds of um, uh, support for, you know, lectures and presentations and, and showcasing publicly engaged scholarship. Um, uh, through our website. Um, we have resources um, at the APSA website that um, on how you can um, learn, do publicly engaged work. And, and, and so there, there's a kind of legitimacy to the to public engaged work that you see on our website and, and in a variety of different ways. Um, we also have funding opportunities for publicly engaged work. We have a Centennial Center that supports a, a wide variety of different uh, initiatives and cooling special projects grants. Um, we have the Partnership for Critical Issues. Um, these have all been, um, we have substantially increased the amount of funding in these areas over the last few years. And, and many of the grants are, are deliberately um, focused on encouraging publicly engaged work. And, and encouraging political scientists to become more engaged in, you know, in, in the public sphere, so to speak. We even have a, a, a training program now called ICER, which is the Institute for Civically Engaged Research. That's a one week training program in June of every year that uh, brings younger scholars together to uh, train them in doing public engagement oriented research. Um, uh, and I think that through, we've also very deliberately thought about how we um, encourage public engagement work through our, the representation in the organization, through our governance, through our committee structure, through um, um, the kinds of grants that we give out, that, that there's a representational, I, I think a very important representational issue and making sure that publicly, people who do publicly engage scholarship are represented within throughout the organization. Um, and I, I think that we also, again, recognize that there are the limitations that APSA has. And so we, we also want to make sure that we work through, um, you know, the departments and, and, you know, working with department chairs, we have a department services committee. And, and we, one of the topics that, that's, that has been um, an ongoing source of conversation within the Department of Services Committee has to do with issues around public engaged work and how that's reflected in promotion and tenure standards. Um, um, but we, we are certainly uh, trying to encourage departments to think broadly about uh, publicly engaged scholarship in, in ways that, that they haven't in the past. Again, recognizing that APSA is only one organization and we don't directly control departments, but we certainly want to encourage them to, to be more active in this area and to encourage that kind of scholarship in, among their own members. Um, I, will, I will stop there. Um, I think that um, it's been a priority. I'll just say one more thing. It, we have identified public engagement as a priority in APSA strategic plan, and, and that has then led us to uh, increase our support over these many different areas of APSA in recent years. And we can see that as an important priority moving forward. And um, again, I'm glad, glad to be here to talk about this important issue. So thanks, Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. And thank you for your leadership on these areas involving um, encouraging public engagement, not only of scholars, but encouraging departments to view public engagement as an important aspect of the life of faculty members and researchers, as well as students. Um, next, let's go to Dr. Block. Um, uh, Dr. Block is one of the members of the Committee on the Status of Blacks in the Profession. That committee is a longstanding committee. It was founded uh, in 1968, I believe, or 1969. Um, and many NCOPS members have been members of APSA, but also specifically 
have have contributed their leadership through the Committee on the Status of Blacks. So we'll 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 come to Dr. Block here to, just to get your views on what associations can do to better support individuals who wish to engage uh, publicly. Honestly, I can't add much to what's being described here. And so like one of the things that I've noticed in my own personal experience with this kind of work is that there are things out there for people who are committed and who are resourceful to do this kind of work. I always feel like the way you strengthen these types of things is that if there are lots of areas that are sort of committed to it and share values with it, connect them all up, right? And so building bridges between different academic organizations and community organizations is one thing. I do this personally with the work that I do, like the community engaged polling work that I do is normally in partnership with a lot of organizations that are among other things committed to the uplift of racial and ethnic minorities, normally in political outcomes, right? And I happen to be part of the Scholar Strategy Network chapter for the part of the country that I'm in. And we're always thinking of ways of figuring out how to use that particular platform as a way to engage students and to recruit people and to empower people to do a lot of this community engaged work. And so what I'm saying is it's these things are there. If we can think of better and creative ways to remind everyone what these things are to connect these organizations and these like-minded individuals, that connection will actually be a strength. And so I'm not really adding much there as much as I'm just saying that we should take advantage of all of the really good things that exist already and amplify them to the degree that we can. Thank you, Dr. Black. Um, Dr. Mishner? Yeah, I, I think that Dr. Block adds a lot. Um, I think that point about bridges is really crucial. I would just add like, you know, spaces like this is like part of what associations do is they help to create spaces like this because we're each in our own university context and can feel pretty alone. Like, oh, I'm really trying to do this. I remember, you know, when I got the job at Cornell and I was looking at different things about the university and I found out they had this big prison education program and I was like, wow, I definitely am gonna do that when I get there. And I was so excited. And then I got there and it was like, nobody does this. Like junior faculty don't do this. This isn't how people spend their time. And I felt alone. Like I really wanna do these kinds of things, but like, should I and who? And so even I'm thinking about being in that headspace at the time, had I come into a space like this, it would have felt like, oh, okay. You know? So it kind of, I think that associations can create spaces like this to help us find <laughs> each other so that we can learn in the ways that we're learning now. I know that um, one of the things that we do on the committee um, on the status of blacks in the profession is that we have uh, spaces at APSA every year, panels that we hold. And even just our, in our most recent meeting, we were talking about, okay, might, might we think about a panel that is centered around um, helping people to think about public engagement and also balancing your life. And, and we, we are kind of really, um, intentionally trying to use the space that the committee is able to create via APSA to encourage these kinds of supportive conversations um, so that we can find our possibility models, so that we can catch our vision, and just so that we don't feel like unicorns in trying to do this work in our individual institutions. Um, so I would say that that's a big part of it. I just, and plus one for ICER, the Institute for um, civically engaged research. Um, I have, you know, done some work with them and just find that it can be a really great institutional space that APSA uh, is able to cultivate. And so look for those institutional spaces that are already out there as well um, and, and use whatever resources that they can offer you. Thank you, Dr. Mishner, and thank you for your leadership of the, um, the status committee. Uh, and then Dr. Willoughby Harrard, um, as we all know, is the president of INCOPES. Um, what is your perspective on how associations and organizations can support scholars who are interested in publicly and civically engaged work? So, okay, so I, because of the con, this context point is so important. So in my campus, African-American studies is in the School of Humanities. 
Um, that is not the case nationally. You know, typically AFAM studies or Black studies or African diaspora is in an arts and sciences school or it's in social sciences. Um, and so that produces particular types of things in terms of um, grant writing for community-based grants and for all different kinds. And so kind of what I want to talk about as I lose my jewelry here, <laughs> kind of what I want to talk about is the, the way that APSA and NCOPES are really committed to creating pathways um, that help social science and help humanistically oriented social science. Um, and so things like the Ralph Bunch Institute and the new Mark Hugh Sawyer UC HBCU program, those are really important. They are absolutely, absolutely important. And what I found is that even though they exist in the humanities, folks didn't know about them. And so there's been three or four times this year where I thought, I just am going to have to bring Kim Mealy and Steve Smith to my campus <laughs> so that they can tell people that in the social sciences, we do the pathways programs and we really will support even humanities students who are doing, you know, humanistically oriented work. Um, and it what comes up for me is the fact that so many black studies departments were founded by political scientists. What comes up for me is that the National Humanities Center was founded by, you know, a Duke University professor who's a political scientist and a poet. These, these relationships uh, and the willingness to do institutional leadership uh, that political scientists continually offer, um, it means that we have a particular role um, in higher education. And I think it's important for us to be willing to step into that role. And when I say higher education, I'm thinking about, um, you know, doing some of the kind of lobbying um, that says that we are leading higher ed. We are leading higher ed. Um, and I think uh, uh, President Ishiyama talked about our role as political scientists wanting to get back into K through 12. Um, I think we have a lot of capacity and um, because of the turn towards more social justice orientation and political science, this is the right moment for us to really be doing that work. But you have to be willing to, you got to say it. We are, we're claiming the space of leadership in higher ed. You have to be willing to say that super forthrightly, um, even in spaces that are not social science spaces, um, because people don't have, there isn't a sense of vision. And if you're doing something good and you've been doing a minority fellows program for 20, 30 years, you got to let the other people know how to do it because they don't know how. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Roby Harard. It, 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 it speaks to the importance, as you say, of community um, and spaces like this. Um, I will say that in my role as Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion, I often am able to participate in meetings and convenings with other association leaders. And oftentimes APSA is looked at as kind of an example of, oh, you have a diversity fellowship program? We don't have one. How did you do that? What does it look like? How do you organize it? Um, or, oh, interesting. I didn't know that APSA had an ombuds that comes to the annual meeting that can speak to individuals who might be experiencing microaggressions or harassment at the meeting. How do you set up an ombuds program? So we've been able to speak with other associations and share with them institutional building advice as to how they can make their spaces more equitable, more welcoming, um, and more positive for all attendees of events and annual meetings and workshops. Um, so that's quite important. Uh, I'd like just to come now to our final question, which brings us back to the theme of this um, 2022 INCOPES uh, meeting. Uh, and the question is for the panelists, what is the world that you are imagining is possible for the future? Uh, and what is the legacy that you hope that we as scholars, we as political scientists, uh, we as students of political science, or we as members of INCOPES, what is the world, what is the legacy that you hope that we will leave behind for the next, uh, millennia. So it is a very broad question. Um, please feel free to approach it in the way that you feel most comfortable. So let's um, let's start with Dr. Mishner. 
Sure. Um, this one is hard, but great, I think. Um, you know, I, I guess when I think about the future, I think about a future where we have resolved the kinds of what feel like um, dilemmas and challenges that we've been trying to help the folks on this Zoom navigate today. In other words, for political science and for academia more broadly, I think about a future where there isn't a perceived or an experienced conflict between um, engagement and doing work that is meaningful in the world and, uh, and scholarship, right? Where those things are working in ways that are self-reinforcing um, so that those of us who want to, and hopefully that's most of us, can pursue research and can pursue scholarship in ways um, that allow us to, to do good in our communities and in the world to the extent possible. I think that that future would be a bright one. Um, and, and beyond that, more broadly, I, I just think, you know, I know a lot of the word that's been coming to mind for me when I think about the future over the last several years has just been justice. Like, what does it look like to have a future where uh, we can transform institutions, including academic institutions, including institutions like these major associations, um, so that institutions are serving justice. Instead of serving capital or serving the status quo or serving the most powerful or serving elite interest, which whether we are comfortable admitting it or not, many of the institutions that we're including myself, I'm not, I'm not on the soapbox here, uh, that we are, you know, deeply embedded in aren't always, um, and sometimes not at all serving uh, justice. And so I think of a future where institutions are transformed in ways that allow us to be able to be part of them at the same time, feel like we're advancing justice and, and like, what's justice? So I don't know, you know, we theorize about that as political scientists, but I, one of the simplest definitions that I tend to fall back on that the most is one that I heard Cornel West from him a few years back, justice is what love looks like in public, right? I mean, we know what it means to love um, in our personal lives, right? And so what does it mean to be able to bring the good that comes from loving relationships as we understand them out into the world? Um, and doesn't that feel so far away from anything that we think about in academia? <laughs> I imagine a future where those things don't feel so far away. Thank you so much for sharing that wonderful message um, and speaking to us about justice. Dr. Block? Yeah, I can't follow that up. So like, uh, <laughs> like Professor mentioned, I was thinking it would be great so it would be great if these types of efforts, these efforts where we try to give people the encouragement to do this publicly engaged but really important work, it would be great in a future where we don't have to do this kind of stuff because it's no longer contested, but ultimately because it's no longer necessary because justice is being served in our society. But I'm just basically repeating what Dr. Missioner said. So I'm gonna shut up and let those words speak for themselves. Thank you so much, Dr. Block. And I, I think you did a wonderful job following up on Dr. Mishner's comments and, and expanding upon them in a wonderful way. Dr. Smith? I, I think I feel a little like Ray. I, it's really hard to follow Jamila's uh, uh, comments and, and I'm not quite sure what to say, but I, I will say that I think um, uh, higher education is in the midst of a you know, transition period. Um, different institutions are responding differently depending upon uh, what their own particular situation is. Uh, that means that many institutions are rethinking their relationship to their communities. And, and I think uh, all of you on this, on this Zoom room here have an opportunity to be in the middle of that rethinking of the role of higher education institutions in, in their communities. And, and I think that this presents some opportunities to really advance um, 
uh, public, not only public engagement work, but also social justice work and, and, and equity broadly defined. Um, and, and so I, I think this, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ferment in higher education. And, and I think that as we think about the future, the future is gonna look differently um, as different institutions respond to the, the, the various political and economic and social challenges that they're facing as well as opportunities. I think the other thing I would say is that um, uh, the, the rethinking of the role of higher education has also meant that, um, that we're also rethinking the traditional pathways for um, people with political science degrees. And so there, there are a lot of great opportunities in the community and broadly defined, whether you're talking about um, foundations, uh, think tanks, consulting firms, um, social justice organizations, uh, working in, in federal agencies. Um, I mean, there's a wide variety of opportunities for political scientists and many political scientists already work in many of those types of organizations. And so I think that, um, that I guess my, my, I would have urge all of you to think broadly about where, where you might bring your skills and talents and interests so that, um, uh, you know, and APSA, we've created a career diversity committee, you know, to, to encourage um, uh, graduate students to think broadly, as well as other scholars, you know, scholars who are, you know, in various kinds of uh, positions at, already in universities to think broadly about what their career prospects are. And I think that there, there's our ways of, of, you know, combining uh, community engagement work with uh, work in academia that, you know, can be very, very productive in, individually and can make a real contribution to the community. So, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we'd like to hear from Dr. Willoughby Harrard on um, your vision of the future. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mealy, for holding this space. Um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to share a quote from the Baltimore, the Community Activism in Baltimore and Washington, D.C. panel from the very first day. Um, we didn't, we weren't able to go to Baltimore um, this year. We made a decision organizationally early on. Um, but something that I learned from that panel, which was organized by uh, Professor Don Wargs of Towson, uh, one DC member and staffer, Dominic Molden, said, quote, I'm organizing with people. We are organizing to create a portal to another world. The only thing that is possible is another world because that's what we need. Um, to get to that other world, we have to have time. We have to have time. We need course release time. We need uh, time in archives. Jana Dietz is on here from the Kluge, Kluge Center from the Library of Congress. We need time. And, you know, uh, I'm so glad that Dr. Block, you're working on this associate professor stage of faculty development, because um, I think the universities have figured out how to get people tenured between the universities, whether they're lackluster or not at it, and NCFDD and activist writers or artists, what is it called? Um, academics writers studio, there's, there's, there's programs that we know how to get people to tenure. But um, getting people to full is is more it continues to be a challenge, and that has really big implications in terms of the debt burden um, and retirement and things like that, and the ability for um, people in political science to continue doing the work that they've you know learned how to do over the course of a career. Um, they may no longer be in higher ed, but they still should be able to live, you know, um, well and be able to eat and that kind of thing. So um, we need we need time. We need time to just be able to integrate our thinking, all the things that we've learned from teaching for many years, all the things that we've learned from these conferences. We need time. Um, and so anything, you know, 
at the crossroads where I sit, the future I imagine we have more time to do political education and to think and to reflect. Thank you so much, Dr. Willoughby Harrard. And I think those are very poignant words to close out our session on. And I also would like to thank you and the leaders of NCOPES for organizing this space and providing the time for us to meet here um, in a very welcoming and enriching and inspiring space. I wanna thank all of the panelists, Dr. Ray Block, Dr. Jamila Mishner, Dr. Steve Smith, and Dr. Tiffany willoughby Harrard for joining us. And I also wanna thank all of the attendees and the wonderful comments and questions and the um, inspirational and positive feedback that we were able to generate in this session. And I just wanna encourage all of us to bring this into your next space, into your next day, into your next year. Um, and, I, and I do echo the words of the panelists in terms of envisioning a future where, where justice and equity and respect are the norm and can be enjoyed by all of us, regardless of our backgrounds and our identities. So thank you again, all. Um, please enjoy the remainder of, of the conference. And thank you again to NCOPS for convening this space. Take care, bye-bye.